Hello there future ACCs, I'm a proud Finn Trama, Vishnu Jai, and your lecturer for the Advanced Audit and Assurance paper. And I welcome you all to the AAA Revision Bootcamp. So, what is this bootcamp all about? Let's understand that first of all, shall we? There are two pillars to the Revision Bootcamp. The first pillar focuses on the revision aspect. Okay, folks, so we will be revising so the key examinable areas of the AAA syllabus so that you can, you know, refresh your memory regarding this concept. And of course, you can use this very same video for revision purposes a few days close to your exam as well. And then there is the second aspect, which I believe is something that you have been waiting for, which is the question practice aspect, where we will be practicing exam standard question as well as past paper questions so that you can learn how to score the both, both the technical marks in the exam as well as the professional marks in the exam. And then there are various other, uh, you know, exam tips, tricks and techniques that you can use to efficiently and effectively present your answer to the examiner in the CBE environment. Okay, folks, so we call it the video question marathon. And that's basically the second pillar. Okay, folks, so we have the revision aspect as well as the, uh, you know, video question marathon as well. Okay, folks, so in this session, we'll be starting with the revision aspect where we'll, we will be going through the key examinable areas of the AAA syllabus. Okay, folks, so let's get started uh, with the first syllabus area of AAA, that is part A, regulatory environment. So folks, what is the first thing that we have to look at here? Basically, before getting into the regulation aspect, which is basically the laws and regulations, which regulates the audit profession, we have to learn about the basics of audit. Okay, folks, so what is the basic? What is an audit exactly? And when we say audit, we are primarily referring to external audit, isn't it? So what is external audit all about? Let's discuss that first of all, shall we? An external audit is a type of assurance engagement that is carried out by an auditor to give an independent opinion on a set of financial statements. So this is basically as to what an audit and uh, audit is all about. Okay, folks, so what an external audit is all about. So what happens here, guys? We have a professional known as the auditor who provides their opinion on it on a on the financial statements of an organization, isn't it? That's basically it. And who is it for? Who are we providing the opinion for? The opinion is provided for the intended users of financial statement, isn't it? Who are basically primarily the shareholders or stakeholders, sorry, shareholders or investors, or there are also other individuals such as the employees of the organizations or the government or the community, etc. Okay, folks, there are uh, a number of stakeholders. That's basically it. And of course, uh, moving on to the next aspect, what is, uh, you know, assurance engagement? We learned, we just read that, uh, you know, external audit is a type of assurance engagement, isn't it? So what is an assurance engagement exactly? Assurance engagement is a broader concept. Okay, folks, and the definition is provided right here. So let's quickly read through this. It is an engagement, okay, folks, a business engagement uh, in which a practitioner obtains sufficient and appropriate evidence you know, in order to express a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party about the outcome of the evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. Now, what does this mean exactly? Let's talk about it, shall we? So there are three parties involved in this particular assurance engagement. We have the practitioner, isn't it? Who is, who is the person who provides the opinion on the subject matter or provides the conclusion on the subject matter. And then we have the responsible party who prepares the subject matter. And then there is the intended users for which the you know practitioner provides a conclusion for. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Uh, in the case of an audit, the practitioner would be the auditor, isn't it? And uh, who would be the responsible party in an audit? This is basically the individual who is uh, responsible for preparing the subject matter, isn't it? And what is the subject matter in an audit? But an external audit, the subject matter would be the financial statements of an organization. Okay, folks, so the responsible party, who is the uh, party who is responsible for preparing the financial statement of an organization. 
the management of the organization, isn't it? So that is basically the responsible party, which we are talking about here. Uh, and then we also have, yeah, intended users, which we discussed as earlier, which basically the stakeholders of the organization. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. Uh, so in an assurance engagement, the practitioner obtain a sufficient appropriate evidence and then, you know, uh, to provide a conclusion on the subject matter for the intended users. And, you know, this particular conclusion is not for the responsible party or in other words, the people who are responsible for preparing the subject matter. Okay, folks, so that's basically the case. And of course, yeah, that's basically the overall concept of assurance engagement and external audit is just a type of assurance engagement. So keep this in mind. Now, Moving on to the next aspect, we have five elements of assurance engagement. Okay, look, there are five elements here. What are the five elements? We can, you know, memorize this using the mnemonic CREST. And what does CREST stands for? C stands for criteria. R is for report. E is for evidence and not just any evidence, sufficient and appropriate evidence. And then there is S which stands for subject matter and T for the three parties involved in the assurance engagement. So this is the criteria. What is the criteria by which the subject matter is assessed? Okay, folks, that's basically what criteria means here, isn't it? So in the case of an audit, we assess the financial statements based on certain standards, isn't it? Basically, the accounting standards and various other principles, or as we call it, the we, we assess it using the applicable financial reporting framework to make sure that everything, every principle has been applied appropriately and the financial statement provides a true and fair view, isn't it? That's basically what we try to, uh, our, what, what our ultimate objective is, isn't it? So that's basically the case. So criteria here is basically the, you know, IA standards or IFR standards as well as, uh, you know, the applicable financial reporting framework as a whole. And then we have the report, which is basically the report on which the opinion would be provided, the written report or in other words, the, uh, you know, uh, independent auditors report. That's basically what we're talking about here. Then we have evidence, okay, folks. So in order to provide an opinion, we can't just plainly state an opinion, isn't it? So there should be some evidence or facts which proves that particular opinion, isn't it? Or which, which supports that particular conclusions or opinion that we provide. And this is exactly why it is stated that uh, in a particular audit engagement or an, any assurance engagement, we should gather the sufficient level of evidence as well as the appropriate level of evidence as well. What does sufficient and appropriate mean? Uh, sufficient means of the right quantity and appropriate means not of the ap appropriate quality as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what evidence is all about. It should be sufficient and appropriate. And as we all know what the subject matter is, it's basically the, uh, you know, uh, matter on which the opinion or conclusion is provided. And finally, we have the three parties involved in the engagement, which is the practitioner, the responsible party and the intended users. Okay, folks, so that's basically the case. I mean, that's basically all about the five elements of assurance engagement. Just a quick, uh, you know, recap of the basic concepts. That's basically it. Now moving on to ISA 200 objectives of an audit. So what exactly is the objective of an audit? Let's talk about that. So first of all, the auditor must provide a true and fair view. Okay, folks, isn't it? So they must, make, they must make sure, they must provide an opinion on the financial statement, which suggests that the financial statement is providing a true and fair view, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. This is basically the first and primary objective. Uh, and secondly, we have to make sure that the, uh, as auditors, we have to make sure that the accounting records are accurate and complete. So what are the accounting records here? We're talking about the journal entries, the ledgers, and you know, everything uh, as such. Okay, folks, that's basically the case. And thirdly, we should ensure that the financial statement is prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework, isn't it? Why exactly is that? Because as we know, the financial statement is prepared to, uh, on the basis of the IFR standards or IAS standards, and there could also be local accounting standards as well, isn't it? Which is exactly why we're using a, a bit more vague term known as, uh, you know, applicable financial reporting framework here. Okay, folks, so keep, keep this in mind. So these are the three objectives of an audit. And uh, moving on to the general principles that an auditor must follow. So the audit profession uh, is regulated by a few uh, principles and you know number of regulations as well. We will look into it. But there are some generic principles that an auditor must follow here. So what are these generic principles? First of all, he or she must comply with or the particular audit team. Okay, folks, audit is not a one man job, isn't it? It's a it's a team effort, isn't it? So the audit team must comply with all the ethical principles issued by, you know, the ACCA's Code of Ethics and Conduct, as well as there are other ethical standards, such as the standards issued by IESB or International Ethics Standards Board as well, isn't it? So we must comply with these standards as well. 
And secondly, there is the International Standards on Auditing, which provides the you know, guiding principle that the auditors must follow to showcase or to provide high quality uh, you know, or professional services to their clients. Okay, folks, so that's basically to what ISAs are. And thirdly, there is the attitude of professional skepticism as well. Okay, folks, so what is professional skepticism? It's basically having a questioning mindset. Okay, folks, as auditors, we should have a questioning mindset and we should be alert to conditions which can indicate in a, any chance of, you know, a fraud or error occurring within the uh, financial statements or within the organization. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Uh, so yeah, these three things are some, are some of the general principles that we need to follow here. Comply with the uh, ethical principles, comply with the IAC standards and, uh, you know, make sure that you are maintaining our professional skepticism throughout the course of the audit. Okay, folks. Now, Moving on to the concept of true and fair view. As stated earlier, one of the objective of, or the main objective of the audit is so that the financial, sorry, is so that the auditor can provide an opinion on the financial statement, which states that the financial statements provide a true and fair view, isn't it? So what is true and fair all about? Let's talk about this, shall we? True means the information is factual and it confirms to reality. Okay, folks, we haven't stated anything that's wrong within the financial statement. That's something that we ensure. And of course, uh, have we complied with the accounting standards and any relevant legislation when preparing the financial statement? That should be assessed. And thirdly, data is correctly transferred from the accounting records to the financial statement. So have we correctly transferred all the data from the journal's ledgers to the, uh, you know, ultimate financial statement, which is the, you know, statement of financial position, statement of profit and loss, statement of changes in equity, statement of cash flow, as well as the notes to financial statements as well. Okay, folks, are they, you know, has, has that particular, you know, accounting information been correctly transferred? That's basically another thing that we focus on here as well. Moving on to the next aspect that is fair. Fair means the information should be clear, impartial, and unbiased as well. Okay, folks, we should, whatever information that we're providing, it should be clearly mentioned and it should not be, you know, uh, manipulated by anyone. That's basically the idea here. And then we have another aspect that is uh, reflect plainly the commercial substance of the transaction. As we've learned, it's like basic accountancy, isn't it? So basically, whenever we are recording a particular transaction or even in an organization, we have to record the commercial substance of that tran transaction over its legal form, isn't it? So that's basically what this, uh, you know, uh, concept is all about. Okay, folks, so this is what the, uh, you know, uh, auditor is trying to confirm. Okay, folks, so rem remember this. Now, moving on to the regulatory aspects. So, as we all know, the when it comes to regulation within the audit profession, there are three main regulations that an auditor must follow. First of all, he must follow the national law, isn't it? So, the national law can vary from country to country. For example, in the U UK, it's basically the Companies Act 2006, whereas, uh, you know, in the US, it's basically the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and, you know, different other countries will have their own legislation as well. So, that's basically something that uh, you know, the auditors will have to comply with. And secondly, there is the, uh, as stated earlier, there is the international standards on auditing. And of course, there are also several other auditing standards as well, such as the ISQM or international standards on quality management as well. Okay, folks, so just comply with all of these. And finally, we should also comply with the code of ethics, both pro uh, provided by the professional body, uh, by the respective professional body. For example, in our case, we have the ACCA's Code of Ethics and Conduct. And of course, there are also other, uh, you know, other principles stated by the uh, International Ethical Standards Board as well. Okay, folks, so comply with all the ethical principles, avoid any, you know, threat to independence or objectivity. That's a really important thing to consider as auditors, okay, folks, and not just as auditors, but as a professional accountant within the industry. Now, moving on to the next aspect, Corporate governance. So what is corporate governance all about? It's basically a system by which companies are directed and controlled, isn't it? So that's basically it, as simple as that. Uh, as I stated here as well, a system by which the companies are directed and controlled. And when we talk about corporate governance, good corporate uh, you know, governance measures can increase the credibility of an organization, isn't it? We've learned about a lot of principles in relation to this as well. So when it comes to the UK corporate governance code principles, we have five headings under it. And this is, it's easy to memorize. You just have to uh, memorize the mnemonic clear here, which where C stands for communication with investors, L is for leadership, E is for effectiveness, A is for accountability, and R is for remuneration as well. So what are the principles that are that were provided under each of these settings? There were many, but to you know roughly give you an idea once again, 
uh, first of all, we have communication with investors, which basically suggests that there should be a, you know, an annual meeting where, uh, you know, ideal conversations or communication between the investors and the board of directors must take place, isn't it? And uh, when it comes to leadership, it's all about, you know, uh, uh, who should lead the organ who should lead the board of directors and the fact that the CEO as well as the chairman should should be two different person to avoid having uh, to avoid one individual having unfettered powers and when it comes to effectiveness we learned that you know there should be a balance in the board between uh, you know ed's executive directors and non executive directors so that you know there's a level of independence within the within the board itself and of course we also lo looked at accountability which uh, basically suggested that you know the board of directors will be accountable for the company's position and prospe prospects and they would have to you know be accountable towards the uh, you know shareholders as well isn't it and finally there is remuneration which basically suggests that there is a, there should be a formal regular, rigorous and transparent process in setting the remuneration of uh, both the executive directors as well as non executive directors and uh, you know the remuneration should be uh, you know, said in such a way that, uh, you know, uh, it, it should, you know, motivate and retain the particular board members within the organization as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically some basic principles which were suggested by the UK Corporate Governance Code principles, isn't it? And then we looked at the committees, isn't it? Primarily, we'll, we should learn, we should always remember about the, you know, audit committee because, you know, we, we sometimes, you know, uh, use the audit committees and you know, we should have the knowledge of that principle to answer some questions that can come up in the exam. Okay, folks, so... Uh, when it comes to the structure of the audit committee, how, it, how, how exactly should it be? Uh, the audit committee should be uh, a group of independent non-executive directors, isn't it? So there should be at least three non-executive directors in a committee for small companies. It can be two as well. And then uh, at least one member of the committee should be, a, should be an appropriately qualified professional with reasoned and relevant, relevant financial experience as well. These are some mandatory rules that we have to follow as well and of course uh you know there could be in, in the scenario you could you know perhaps identify instances where these sort of you know corporate governance uh principles may not have been complied with as well okay folks you should identify such situations isn't it so if that comes up okay folks, the, the chances are it uh you know the chances are you know kind of uh i would say yeah 50 percent i would say it can or cannot come but uh if it comes then unless you have this knowledge you won't be able to identify that isn't it so it's really relevant that you know about this and of course we also learned about the advantages and disadvantages of having the audit committees as well so keep on revising that those are really important and moving on to the next aspect that is public interest oversight board so what is the uh, objective of this particular board let's talk about that so basically uh, to protect the you know public interest isn't it as simple as that the uh, public interest oversight board was set up in 2005 to oversee the ifac's auditing and assurance uh, ethics and educational standard setting activities and its membership compliance program so it's basically a board that oversees the ifac's auditing and assurance practices isn't it that's basically it uh, and of course as the name says it's an organization that pro protects the public's interest as simple as that okay folks if there is anything happening within the industry that is against the public interest then uh, you know the, the poib would point that out and spread to identify a solution for it okay folks so that's basically the case so why exactly do we need regulation that's a really important question isn't it so uh it's kind of the uh, kind of straightforward because there has been a lot of you know uh corporate scandals happening uh which has happened in the past few years especially uh you know some to give you some examples there is worldcom or enron etc isn't it so uh due to these uh you know the profession the audit profession and various other profession uh, various accounting profession used to be self-regulated However, due to these corporate scandals, now we it, it, now the profession should be overseen by another body, okay, folks, which is the IFAC, which is the apex body, which oversees all the other professional bodies, isn't it? That's basically it. Now, let's read about it. There was once a time when the profession was self-regulatory. This means that the standards were set by the profession for the profession to follow. But due to the emergence of high-profile corporate, fa uh, corporate failures like Enron, the system of self-regulation became became quite questionable. Thus, the uh, regulatory framework came to place. This enables the provision to be overseen by other organizations such as the IFAC. Simple as that. That's why there is a need for regulation. Simple as that. Uh, moving on to the next aspect, we have money laundering, isn't it? Money laundering is a really serious issue and there can be questions tested in the exam in relation to this as well. Okay, folks, there could be some uh, issue hidden within the scenario which could indicate money laundering activities which we, we may have to point out isn't it so let's uh quickly revise through this once again what is money laundering money laundering is a process by which 
criminals attempt to conceal the true origin and ownership of proceeds generated by illegal means, allowing them to maintain control over the proceeds and ultimately providing a legitimate cover over the source of income. So, uh, this particular criminals, what they do is they gather proceeds from conducting some sort of illegal activity and then what they do is they provide a legitimate cover over this particular uh, proceeds. That's basically as to what money laundering activities it's all about. And there are three stages to the money laundering process, which is placement, layering, and integration. What is placement? This is basically the first stage when the money laundering process, where the proceeds received from illegal sources are placed into the financial system. What happens here, guys? The uh, criminals, what they do is the, uh, they gather the proceeds and they, uh, you know, enter it within the system, within the uh, financial system. That's basically all there is to it. And then we, we move on to the second step that is layering. So layering is when the origin of the proce uh, proceeds is covered up by passing it through a series of complex transactions, such as it may be moved to a, let's say, foreign account, or it may be invested in a particular business, uh, which does not necessarily have any purpose, etc. Okay, books, there are multiple instances like that. And of course, uh, there is also integration as well. What is integration? Integration is basically the final stage where the money laundering process, where, the, where, where you provide a legitimate cover for the proceeds by using it to buy legal goods, as simple as that. Okay, books, it's just, you know, covering up the, uh, you know, money laundering, uh, the uh, proceeds from criminal activities. That's basically it. Okay, folks. So these are the three stages involved in the money laundering process, as simple as that. So in order to fight against money laundering, we also have some anti-money laundering programs, isn't it? So what are these? Let's take a look at that, shall we? First of all, there should be risk assessment procedures within, you know, organizations to make sure that there is no money laundering activity happening and, uh, you know, to assess the risk of a money laundering activity or potential money laundering activity happening within the organization. And of course, there should be sufficient level of internal controls within the organizations to identify and detect such activities from happening within the organization. There should be customer due diligence. What is customer due diligence? It's basically, you know, knowing your customer, isn't it? Try to, uh, you know, obtain more information about the, uh, you know, customers with which you do the, uh, you know, do business transactions or, uh, you know, business activities with. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. And of course, there is also enhanced record keeping, which is basically, uh, you know, keeping records of whatever transactions has been conducted with the customers or suppliers, etc. And this particular records can should be retained for uh, you know a minimum of maybe five years or so okay folks it can be even more and i believe the professional body suggests to uh, you know keep it for around seven years or so so uh, yeah that's basically it okay folks retain the records to uh, a fixed period like that have a policy like that within the organization and of course we keep the record of everything and everything that has been conducted as part of things like uh, you know customer due diligence or know your client procedures etc okay folks as simple as that and finally, we can also appoint a money laundering reporting officer or MLRO within the organization to detect and tackle against these sort of suspicions, etc. Okay, folks, so the MLRO can provide a platform within the organization to report money laundering activities. Okay, folks, so that's basically the case. And what exactly are potentially suspicious transactions? Let's, uh, let's understand that, shall we? So potentially suspicious transaction would include unusually large cash deposits, that's basically something that we can uh, that can that can you know point out as a suspicion of money laundering activities. Secondly, there will be frequent exchange exchanges of cash into other currency. As I stated before, you know cash balances may be transferred to a foreign account to change it to, to uh, another currency. This is a part of you know layering process. So yeah, that's basically another indication. And of course, overseas business arrangements with no clear business purpose is another indication of money laundering activities as well. Okay, folks, so these are basically some examples of money laundering activities as simple as that. Now, moving on to another uh, audit standard that is in relation to laws and regulations. So who has the primary responsibility for ensuring that an organization is complying with the laws and regulations? Is it the auditors? No, not really, isn't it? So the management of that particular audit client or organization will have the primary responsibility of making sure that they have complied with all the laws and regulation within its home jurisdiction. However, what is the auditor's responsibility then? The auditor is responsible for uh, providing a, for obtaining reasonable assurance that the financial statement is free from material misstatement due to non-compliance with laws and regulations or NOCLAR. So the idea here is basically simple. It's just that, you know, the auditor, what they have to do is their primary focus is on the financial statement. Okay, folks. So if, let's say, due to a non-compliance, if there is any impact on the financial statement, then the auditor will have to act upon it. Okay, folks. Otherwise, we do not have the responsibility to make sure that the organization has 
you know, you know, complied with the laws and regulations or not. Okay, folks, we may, you know, obtain an understanding of the laws and regulations, but we don't necessarily have to, uh, you know, look for non-compliances for the organization. But if due to a non-compliance, there is some sort of impact in the financial statements, then we will have to look into it. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And then we have reporting aspects. So if we have identified any sort of, you know, non-compliance, who should, whom should we report it to? We should first of all report it to the audit committee. And if they do, they haven't you know taken any action, then we could report it to those charged with governance. And if they are not taking any action, then what we can do is we can uh, report it to the regulatory or enforcement authorities after seeking legal advice. Now, why exactly do we seek legal advice here when we have to communicate things to the regulatory authority? I mean, there's the regulatory authorities such as you know police force or something like that, isn't it? So why exactly do we need to seek legal advice here? That's basically because. Uh, you know, the matter is something confidential and by communicating this confidential information to an enforcement authority, we are breaching our confidentiality agreement, isn't it? So that's basically why we have to seek legal advice. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. And finally, we will report to, those, to report to the shareholders through a paragraph in the auditor's report. That's basically how we communicate it to the shareholders. We don't, you know, go to the shareholders and state that, you know, we, the organization is not complying with laws and regulations. We just communicate it to them using the auditor's report. Now, moving on. So that's all for syllabus area A. That is the that, are, that those were basically the key syllabus areas in part A of the syllabus. Now moving on to uh, the second syllabus area that is part B, ethics and professional considerations. So let's take a look at as to what this is all about, shall we? So the first and foremost thing that we learned here was in relation to the ACC's code of ethics and contact, isn't it? Which is basically the five fundamental principles of ethics. So let's take a look at it, shall we? An easy way to memorize this is using the mnemonic COPEP. Okay, folks, so C stands for confidentiality, O is for objectivity, P is for professional competence and due care, I is for integrity, and P is for professional behavior. So we've been, you know, hearing this for quite a few papers now, isn't it? So that's basically uh, as to what the fundamental principles are. Confidentiality means that, you know, in the case of an audit, it means that the auditors must not disclose any sort of, you know, confidential information to a, uh, uh, you know, third party such as, uh, such as anyone, okay, folks, any, uh, you know, uh, friends or family members or, you know, another organization, especially, isn't it? So we should not, we should not do that. And unless, okay, folks, unless there is a legal or professional duty to do so, okay, folks, if let's say our organization is involved in, let's say, money laundering activities or, uh, you know, drug trafficking or any serious issues like that, then we could, you know, communicate these aspects to, uh, to the uh, you know relevant uh, you know enforcement authorities or regulatory authorities etc. Okay, folks. So that's basically as to what confidentiality means. Then we have uh, you know objectivity, which basically means that our judgments, professional judgments that we take, should not be biased or influenced by anyone. That's basically it. Professional competence and due care means that you know you have to be you know up to date regarding your skill and knowledge regarding the all the updated standards and various other you know knowledge area aspect knowledge aspects as well. Okay, folks. So that's basically the idea here. And and of course, uh, you know, this can enable you to provide high quality services to your, uh, you know, audit clients. Integrity is kind of straightforward. It's, it's all about being, you know, being straightforward and honest in all professional relationships. And then we have professional behavior, which basically means that, you know, you should not, your actions should not disrepute the profession or the, you know, audit profession as a whole. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, idea here. And then we talk about conflict of interest or scenarios where conflict of interest can arise. Okay, folks, this is a common scenario that can, you know, that could come up in your exam. So what exactly would you do? What kind of safeguards can you take in order to uh, reduce the risk to an acceptable level? Let's talk about that. Okay, folks, the first thing that you have to do is what, what is the scenario of conflict of interest? First of all, let me clear that up. First of all, so basically, uh, it's basically when you are auditing two competitors. Okay, folks, that's basically the case. If that is the case, then there is a risk that, you know, you you mean, you know, there is a chance that the audit team members may leak out commercially sensitive or confidential information with each of these, uh, to each of these clients, isn't it? So in order to avoid that risk, what we can do is, first of all, we have to notify both the clients that we are auditing, you know, the competitors. And then secondly, uh, we have to obtain consent from both the uh, companies to audit both of them. And we should use separate teams to avoid any leakage of commercially sensitive information. We can prevent access to information by the teams as well. Uh, 
by by making them sign let's say confidentiality agreements or making them comply with certain guidelines as well and of course uh you know review the safeguards by an independent senior so we can assign an independent senior or independent you know partner of sorts to review the level of safeguards that we have uh, in place to make sure that you know a conflict of interest doesn't arise uh and then uh yeah we can also create a chinese wall to you know prevent both these uh you know teams from meeting with each other etc and finally uh you know if the threat cannot be reduced to an acceptable level then we what we have to do is we just have to make a commercial judgment and we retain the bigger client and give away the smaller one as simple as that okay folks so this is the step by step process to deal with a situation where a conflict of interest can arise now moving on to the ethical threats and ethical threats is yet again something that we've been hearing for quite a few papers now isn't it so uh, remember guys uh, there's an easy way to remember this that is as if so as if is basically uh, you know in the morning that you can use to remember the threats that is advocacy it stands for advocacy threat which is the threat that you know uh, the auditors or the audit firm might represent the client in front of a third party and then there is the self interest threat which can you know arise due to a number of reasons such as having a, a business relationship with the audit client or having a financial interest in the audit client etc and self review threat can arise uh, when uh, you know you're reviewing your own work for example if you've provided uh, you know valuation or taxation service in a particular audit client and then you're auditing that client again then uh, as auditors you would still be a bit reluctant to review your own work on the tax area isn't it so that's basically an example of uh, self review threat then we have intimidation threat which is basically uh, you know the psychological pressure that is imposed upon the auditors due to uh, your number of uh, factors such as you know having uh, outstanding fees or uh, you know uh, you know management uh, management pressurizing uh, the auditors to meet a particular deadline etc and finally we have familiarity threat which basically occurs due to a close relationship that you may have with some key per personnel or a key official within the audit client okay folks so that's basically it so you are for example your immediate you know uh siblings or immediate uh you know it's not immediate yeah uh, immediate uh, family members may be uh you know or working in a, in a particular position within the audit client isn't it so that's basically in a, uh, that's basically one situation another situation is when you have completed a tenure of let's say 7 years or so that you become too close with the client it looks that that's another situation where a familiarity threat can arise as well and moving on to the next aspect we have safeguards and safeguards can be implemented at the firm level at the professional level as well as the uh, individual level as well so at the firm level we have a number of safeguards such as uh, you know having you know confidentiality agreements uh, or or assessing independence of uh, you know uh, having a let's say you know independence confirmation form etc so that uh, we can confirm the independence of the particular auditors auditing the particular audit client and of course uh, at the professional level we have our you know uh, up to date uh, you know technical articles and various other uh, updates on the industry being provided so that we can provide competent uh, competent services to the audit client and of course at an individual level you should be you know uh, at an individual level you should be up to date with all these uh, you know updated standards and uh, you know uh, uh, make sure that you are complying with the cpd requirements on a yearly basis and try have an have an, indi an individual mentor okay or or your own mentor uh, to or to whom you can you know ask for certain advice regarding certain situations as well okay folks these are some basic safeguards that you can uh, you can have within you know different levels and then uh, there is the aspect of professional skepticism okay folks what is professional skepticism as i stated earlier it's an attitude of having having a questioning mindset but it's not just that it's also being alert to conditions which may indicate a possible misstatement due to error or fraud and a critical assessment of the audit evidence so there are three basic things okay folks first of all keep an attitude of a questioning mindset throughout the course of the audit and throughout the course of the audit you have to be alert of certain you know indications or conditions that can indicate a misstatement within the financial statement due to fraud or error and finally for the evidence that you have collected conduct a critical assessment is this evidence enough or in other words to be more specific is this evidence sufficient and appropriate that is something that we have to confirm as well and then we have uh, you know another uh, you know uh, audit standard that is uh, fraud and error which it again uh, some, is something that we looked at throughout the uh, you know video lectures isn't it so uh, let's talk about this what is fraud a fraud is an intentional act involving the use of deception to obtain unjust and illegal advantage isn't it so the two types of fraud are basically misappropriation of assets as well as 
fraudulent financial reporting as well, which is basically, you know, uh, for example, uh, let's say that you're trying to, you know, capitalize a particular intangible asset uh, or capitalize a particular development cost, even though, uh, you know, it has not met the criteria as per IAS 38. So just an example. Okay, folks, that's basically some example of these fraudulent activities. And then we have error as well. Error is actually not intentional, isn't it? It's an unintentional misstatement because you do, you know, an accident or, you know, something that the, uh, due to a, uh, uh, let's say an omission of a particular amount or disclosure. That's basically the case. Uh, and then there is something called known as ir irregularity as well. What is irregularity? Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll explain the situation here. It's basically intentional, an intentional misstatement to mislead the users. For example, let's say that you've identified an error in the, in the financial statements and you've pointed out, pointed this particular error out to the management. However, the management has not taken any action to amend this er error. If that is the case, then what, what would happen? Then obviously that, that should be considered as an irregularity than an error. Okay, folks, because we're just, uh, you know, assuming that it is intentional, as simple as that. Now, uh, that's basically all about fraud and error. And uh, who has the primary responsibility to detect and prevent error, uh, fraud and error from happening within the organization? Is it the auditors? No, not necessarily, isn't it? It's the responsibility of the management. Okay, folks, and what is the auditor's responsibility here? It's kind of similar to laws and regulations. The auditors must obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statement is not materially misstatement due to fraud or error. Okay, folks, that's basically the responsibility of an auditor. And the reporting aspect is kind of similar to laws and regulations as well. First of all, you uh, report any you know findings to the audit committee. If they don't take any action, then go to those charged with governance. And if they don't take any action, then go to uh, you know the re re uh, yeah regulatory or enforcement authority after seeking legal advice. And finally, communicate this particular finding to the shareholders through your auditor's report. As simple as that. Okay, folks. So that's basically the responsibilities. Now moving on to the next aspect that is professional liability for auditors. So this is a really important aspect, isn't it? Because it's a professional issue that can arise in some scenarios. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, in the AAA exam, ethical, uh, ethic, uh, pointing out ethical issues or quality management issues or professional issues are kind of a common question, isn't it? So you have to be prepared for this and you have to understand what the concept is, isn't it? So let's quickly uh, run through this uh, as well. So when we talk about professional liability, there is liability to clients and liability to third parties as well, isn't it? So what is the liability to clients all about? Let's take a look. The auditors have a contract with the client. A professional liability arises when there is a breach of this contract law. Okay, folks, so we, you know, when we sign an audit, uh, when we, you know, accept a particular audit engagement, we sign something known as the audit engagement letter, isn't it? So the audit engagement letter has some terms and conditions to it. So if the auditors breach some some of those terms and conditions, then most definitely, or if let's say the auditors does not provide, uh, you know, quality services to the client, then the client can sue us for it. Okay, folks, so that's basically the case. And then there is a liability to third party as well. So let's quickly run through this as well. What's the idea here, guys? And this could be as part of a, you know, advocacy threat as well. Let's take a look. A third party can sue the auditors if the auditors have breached the law of tort. The law of tort actually means that you have to look at three things here. First of all, the auditor must demonstrate a duty of care. Okay, folks, we will look into as to what duty of care is uh, all about Ashmit shortly. Secondly, has the auditors breached any standards? That's something that, you know, the third party would have to prove. And of course, another instance is when the third party occurred financial loss as a result on relying on the auditors as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically another example situation, isn't it? So moving on to the uh, duty of care aspect. What is a duty of care all about? Duty of care exists when uh, there is a special relationship between the parties. Okay. So in order for the third party to prove that, uh, you know, the audit firm has, you know, has not showcased the duty of care, what they have to do is they have to prove three things here. The first uh, aspect that they have to prove is as to whether the auditor knew or should have known that the third party would rely on the financial statements. Okay, folks. So uh, did the audit auditors have knowledge that this particular third party under question here uh, you know, may rely on their opinion. That's one aspect. Secondly, whether the third party has sufficient proximity. Okay, folks, is there a close relationship between the third party as well as the audit client uh, that the auditor know of? And what else? Whether they would have acted differently if financial statement has shown a, had shown a different picture as well. Okay, folks, that's yet again another uh, area where we uh, the third party 
could prove that auditors have not showcased the duty of care as well. Okay, folks, if they if they are able to prove you know these three things, then most definitely uh, you know the auditors will be liable. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. And so, if there is some sort of liability like that, how can we reduce the uh, you know risk of becoming liable? Let's talk about that, shall we? So we can uh, you know conduct client screening uh, procedures to make sure that you know we are accepting the right client with or you know. Uh, we're not accept we're not expecting sorry accepting any clients which is of a high risk nature and then uh, we can also adhere to the you know terms of uh, engagement letter isn't it that's basically uh, the easy way out isn't it and then uh, we can restrict the use of reports to the intended purposes and quality management is uh, yet again another really important area to consider here as well and then there is uh, insurance. Uh, having a professional indemnity insurance can reduce the risk to an acceptable level and uh, having a limited liability partnership or liability cap with clients as well okay folks who in a limited liability uh you know partnership we would we should be able to you know limit the level of uh, you know liability that we have isn't as the name suggests as simple as that and finally what is uh what is liability cap that that's that would be something new isn't it so we we, we have already learned about uh you know limited liability partnerships uh, from you know great uh, i believe you know 12th grade accountancy basic uh, business studies etc so uh, what is liability cap though what is liability cap with uh, clients mean it basically means that within your uh, audit agreement there should be a clause which limits the liabilities of the auditors that's basically it okay, because there should be something in writing which suggests that you know there is a limit to the you know liability that the auditors uh, can take okay folks so that's basically the case uh, kind of like a disclaimer of sorts within the agreement that's basically it now uh, not a disclaimer opinion don't uh, you know misunderstand with that uh now so that's all for the uh you know syllabus part b which was uh all about the uh ethical and professional considerations isn't it so now we are looking at another really interesting uh, syllabus area that is quality management as well okay folks so what is quality management all about let's have a quick look in that before we deep dive into the concepts of quality management, first of all, let's understand what the audit engagement letter is all about, shall we? So what is the audit engagement letter? It's basically the fact that before commencing the audit, the audit firm and the audit client comes to an agreement with certain terms and conditions. This agreement is, uh, this agreement is documented and it's known as the audit engagement letter. So what's the idea here guys it's an agreement between both the audit client as well as the audit firm isn't it regarding how the audit should be conducted what is the scope of audit and what kind of responsibility do each parties have etc okay folks, that's basically it and of course it can be used as evidence and you know court if any any you know professional liability or anything has come up or uh you know we can just uh you know use it to avoid any sort of misunderstanding or in other words to be more specific you can uh, reduce the level of expectation gap between the management as to what the management expects the auditor to do and what the auditor actually can do okay folks so that's basically why we use this now moving on to quality management so when it comes to quality management there are three standards that we have to keep in mind here okay folks there is the isa 220 revised quality management for an audit of financial statements and then there is isqm1 which is quality management for firms that perform audits or review uh review of financial statements uh and other assurance or related uh, service engagement and isqm2 which is engagement quality control reviews as well now the primary difference between isa 220 and isqm1 is that isq isa 220 focuses on individual level quality management okay folks what exactly can each and every individual within the audit team do in order to ensure quality that's basically what isc 220 focuses on however isqm1 focuses on quality management at a firm level what can the firm do the audit firm do you know to ensure quality that's basically it and isqm2 is primarily focused on the engagement quality reviews and you know who who is supposed to conduct this and how is it conducted etc and all the documentation aspect as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the case. And uh, we we will learn about, you know, uh, around, I believe, seven elements, right? Yeah, uh, we have six, seven, eight elements, sorry. Yeah, eight elements in relation to quality management systems. Uh, and each of these elements, it does provide, uh, you know, guidance on uh, certain various aspects. So let's take a look at each of these. First of all, we have leadership responsibilities, which basically suggests that, you know, who is the leader in the audit team? In the audit team, the leader would always be the audit engagement partner, isn't it? 
So this particular individual have some responsibilities such as this particular individual should make sure that the audit team has the appropriate level of you know staff included or resources included within them within them and they have complied with all the professional standards as well as all the ethical standards etc as well and then yeah uh, we go to ethical requirement which yet again suggests that the audit team and the audit firm must ensure that they are complying with all the ethical standards and there is no uh, you know uh, ethical threats arising or th any threats to independence or objectivity arising uh, in any situation and uh, there is acceptance and continuance which basically uh, takes a look at take, which basically take a look at the uh, you know process in which engagements are accepted uh, have they been accepted appropriately or, or, or are there any issues in the acceptance uh, procedures have we met the preconditions of the audit or have we conducted professional clearance all these things are mentioned over here and then we have engagement resources as well where we look at three basic sets of resources there is the uh, human resource first of all as to you know whether as to whether do we have the appropriate level of staff with the appropriate level of uh, skill and experience and there are technological uh, resources as well and then there are intellectual resources such as the audit methodology as well okay folks so these are some of the resources that uh, the audit team must ensure that they have to conduct the audit and then we talk about uh, engagement performance as well so when we talk about engagement performance we talk about the direction supervision and review of performance okay folks so what is direction all about it's basically directing the team to achieve the final audit, final objective that is to provide a you know a reasonable assurance on the financial statement isn't it that's basically it and supervision is basically continuous overseeing of the work done by the audit team members to ensure that we are conducting the work to the appropriate quality and of course, it's more in about uh, another aspect. To it. There's another aspect to it as well. Uh, for example, if there is some sort of an issue that have arise during the course of audit, then we should be able to, uh, you know, resolve that issue as quick as possible, isn't it? So that's basically the idea behind supervision and review. Well, that's basically something that we've learned in the uh, audit and management syllabus as well, isn't it? So just to, uh, you know, recap that particular aspect as well, review is all about, you know, reviewing the work conducted. Okay, folks, we are reviewing, not the financial statements here, we're talking about the work, reviewing the work conducted by the auditors themselves. Okay, folks, why do we do this? This is just to ensure that we are providing, uh, we have conducted the sufficient amount of work, we have, uh, you know, gathered sufficient appropriate evidence and our opinion is appropriate as well. Okay, folks. And when we talk about review, we talk about two types of review. There is the, uh, uh, you know, hot review as well as cold review. Okay, folks, what is hot review? Hot review is basically reviewing the, uh, you know, uh, audit work before signing the audit report. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Uh, and we do this for, you know, high risk audit clients as well as some listed entities as well. And then there is cold review, which is basically conducting a review of the audit work after signing the auditor's report. And this is just to ensure, this is like a, you know, a firm level quality control, sorry, a firm level in, internal control, just to ensure that we are, uh, you know, doing the work appropriately and to the appropriate quality as well. That's basically it. Okay, folks, we will be just, you know, reopening some, you know, completed audit, audit files and then reviewing the work. That's basically it. And yeah, both of these are conducted by another independent, uh, you know, senior or you know, cold reviews are conducted usually by independent seniors or uh, managers or, you know, uh, partners as well. However, hold review is usually conducted by an other uh, independent partner. Okay, folks, it should be an experienced, much more experienced independent partner. Okay, folks, so now keep, keep this in mind. And then we have monitoring and remediation. So what's the idea here, guys? So once we have some sort of internal controls within the audit firm, we can't just, you know, implement them and leave it be, isn't it? We have to make sure that the internal controls that we have in place at the audit firm, not at the, you know, audit client, we're talking about the audit firm here, okay, folks? So we're just making sure that the controls within the audit firm is working appropriately and we are able to deliver the work to the appropriate quality as well. And if we have identified any sort of issues in the audit work being conducted, have we taken the remedial action to it? That is basically what this element is all about. Okay, folks, so monitor as to whether everything is working appropriately. And if you identify any issues, you're just going to uh, take a remedial action to it. Okay, folks, that's basically the case. And finally, we have or, uh, overall responsibility, which is all about, you know, the overall responsibility of the audit. Who has the overall responsibility of the audit? The audit engagement partner, isn't it? So that's basically the case. And finally, we have documentation as well. Okay, folks, in documentation, the idea is basically this. 
we document as auditors we document any and everything isn't it so we're just making sure that the documentation is appropriate or not for example if we have let's say consulted with an external firm regarding a particular issue so what is consultation in that in that sense that's something that that needs to be understood as well isn't it? so what is consultation consultation is when uh, you know uh, when let's say the audit if the audit team members are faced with an, with an issue which they don't know the solution for then what they do is they ask for help okay folks so what what they can do is they can consult with another independent partner or another bit more experienced team member within the uh, firm itself okay folks it's it's not uh, you know within the team but within the firm okay folks outside the team and within the firm that's basically the first place that we look for uh, you know experienced professionals however if there is no one within the audit firm then what we do is we take a look at we go to an external consultant okay folks and that's that that this particular aspect or this consultation aspect should be documented as well okay folks so have we documented everything that's basically what documentation element is all about so these are all of the elements of quality management systems it's a simple thing that's basically it but in your exam What's going to happen is you would be required to uh, you know identify instances where there would be a quality management issue and we will be practicing uh, you know a lot of questions in relation to this area within the uh, question marathon as well so don't worry about that but uh, note this point in your exam you'll have to take a look at a scenario and identify the quality management issues from it and wherever possible you have to provide a solution for this as well for example if a manager is lacking in some uh, you know has has lagged in demonstrating uh, or have not complied with any professional standards then uh, should we provide them with the appropriate level of training or should we take any disciplinary action against him except all these things should be mentioned it all depends upon the scenario as to what needs to be done okay folks so uh, there's that now moving on to the next aspect so let's take a look at ISA 210 agreeing the terms of engagement shall we so an audit engagement can be obtained through three methods there is the direct client request advertising and then tendering as well okay folks what is direct client request this is basically when the audit client directly comes to the audit firm uh, you know asking if we can you know audit the financial statements or not that's basically a straightforward process and then we have advertising this is where the audit firm advertises themselves that they you know can provide uh, opinion on financial statements etc these pro we provide this this and the services etc that's basically it uh, and this can be done through various means such as you know publishing the uh, advertisement through various uh, let's say you can use digital marketing techniques or whatever possible or you can uh, let's say uh, use uh, publish this information on certain business journals etc okay folks that's basically the, some of the methods and then there is tendering as well this is which is you know commonly seen in the industry so tendering is basically when uh, you know the audit client announces that they are required to be audited and uh, you know all the audit firms uh, who is capable of conducting an audit for this particular organization will send a tender document to it and the audit firm will choose the appropriate audit firm okay folks that's basically the process of tendering as simple as that uh, now moving on to the next aspect before accepting nominations so before accepting nominations we conduct a process known as client screening isn't it so what all things do we look at in client screening we can do look at f 3 p 3 r and 2 m isn't it so what does it stands for i stands for independence and objectivity are there any independence and objectivity issues or in other words are there any ethical threats arising or not we can take a look at the fees okay folks is the fee acceptable or will the fee give rise to any uh, let's say self interest threat or so that's something that needs to be considered and how is the fee determined guys in an audit engagement the fee is determined depend, uh, as per the level of work required okay folks so no uh, you know over uh, over like do not accept too much of fees which is uh, you know more than 15% of our revenue or uh, do not try to low ball as well okay folks that's basically an important uh, point to remember and uh, then we have the preconditions of the audit, which is basically to obtain an acknowledgement from the management that they acknowledge the fact that it is their responsibility to prepare the financial statement in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. And it is their responsibility to make sure that the internal controls within the firm are operating effectively. And it is their responsibility to provide us with the appropriate set of documents which are relevant to the audit. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And then there is professional competence as well. So are we competent enough to conduct the audit? That's basically something that we have to take a look at. Do we have the appropriate level of, uh, you know, skills and capabilities, etc. And then we also look at the professional clearance aspect as well. What is professional clearance? This is basically when we contact the previous auditors, if, if it's an initial engagement, we contact the previous auditors 
uh, with the permission of the client, of course, uh, to make sure that there is no issue in the previous audit and to you know obtain certain work papers, etc. Okay, folks. So that's basically the case. And then we have reputation of client, which is another key aspect, isn't it? So we're just ensuring as to whether the audit audit client is a reputed firm or not. Because if it is, then you know by auditing it, our firm's reputation will also increase. It has there's some you know, commercial uh, sense over there as well. And then we have risks as well. So is it a risky client? If it is, if it, is it a too risky client uh, or not? Okay, folks, if it is too risky, then we would much rather you know politely decline the offer to audit, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. And then there is resources as well. Do we, uh, or in other words, does the audit firm? have the appropriate level of resources to audit this particular client. That's basically what we are looking for over here. And then there is management integrity. That's another key point, isn't it? Is the, uh, you know, does the management uh, comply with integrity or or is there any uh, issues in relation to that particular aspect? Because if the management uh, is not honest and straightforward, then what would happen? Then most probably we cannot rely on any of the evidences produced by them, isn't it? So that's basically the problem here. And of course, are they engaged in any sort of money laundering activities as well? So these are some of the aspects that we look at before accepting an audit engagement. As simple as that, or we just conducted as part of the client screening process. So that's all for part C, quality management. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the uh, part D of the syllabus, that is planning and conducting an audit of historical financial information. And this is the syllabus area where we look at the entire audit process from planning to execution. Okay, folks. Reporting is something that we look at in the next syllabus area. So let's start, get started, shall we? So when it comes to syllabus part D, the first thing that we are taking a look at is ISA 260, communicating with those charged with governance. Okay, folks. And here we look at three things. First of all, what are the things that need to be communicated? Secondly, when should it be communicated? And thirdly, how should it be communicated as well? So what are the things that needs to be communicated to those charged with governance? We have to communicate as to what exactly are, let's say, the internal control deficiency that have arised. We have to communicate, you know, the overall planning of the audit, planning and scope of the audit should be communicated. And, you know, auditors' responsibilities or management responsibilities can be communicated to avoid any sort of expectation gap as well, isn't it? And we can also communicate some, you know, significant matches that arise during the course of audit. For example, we detected some sort of fraudulent activity or uh, we've, uh, we've detected a non-compliance with uh, laws and regulations. If all these things happen, then we could communicate it to those charged with governance, isn't it? So that's basically as to what the things that needs to be communicated are all about. So when exactly should we communicate this? We can communicate this throughout the course of audit. Okay, folks, we can communicate things at the planning stage, uh, during the audit, as well as at the review or reporting stage as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the case. And finally, how should it be communicated? We can't just orally communicate everything, isn't it? There should be appropriate written documentation. For example, uh, if it is, let's say, uh, the planning related aspects, then we could communicate that within the planning meeting itself, isn't it? Because during the planning meeting, they do, we do have a representative from the audit client, those charged with governance participating in it so that they can understand the scope and, uh, you know, the strategy as well. Now, uh, if we are talking about internal control deficiencies, then we can, uh, you know, communicate this using the management letter or uh, letter, letter, of, uh, yeah, letter to management, etc. Uh, to uh, those charged with governance and uh, you know we could you know conduct ongoing com communication whenever a particular significant matter arises as well okay folks so that's basically as to how it should be communicated as well it should be a formal approach you can't just you know go ahead and uh, announce in the office that we have an issue or something like that isn't it so that's basically the case here now moving on to the next aspect isa 265 communicating deficiencies in internal controls to those charged with governance so folks, unlike in the audit and assurance exam, you won't be tested anything. Uh, you won't be tested anything like where there would be a scenario and you have to identify the internal control deficiencies or anything. However, you may have to identify some control risk that's there. You folks, that's that's as part of the you know audit risk question. However, uh, you don't necessarily have to you know identify deficiencies and recommend controls or anything. Okay, folks, that's not something that's tested in the AAA exam. However, uh, we, we still have to identify the uh, difference between a significant deficiency and uh, other deficiencies, isn't it? So what is, uh, or how do we deal with significant deficiencies? Significant deficiency, it depends upon the impact of that deficiency so as to uh, whether it, it will have a huge impact on the financial statement figures or not. That's basically it. Uh, and it is communicated in writing to the, to those charged with governance. And what is that document known as? 
management letter, isn't it? So keep this in mind. And in a report to management or a management letter, uh, at the end of the audit process and communicate it to those charge with governance as well. So that's basically it. So we report it to management through the management letter and of course, you know, ultimately those charge with governance as well. What about the other deficiencies? If there are, uh, you know, there would be other deficiencies which may not have a significant impact to the financial statements. So we don't necessarily have to provide an opinion on them. Okay, folks, we don't necessarily have to provide an opinion on the internal control system. Okay, folks, because, you know, we're learning the UK syllabus here, so, uh, or international syllabus as well. We don't, we, we don't necessarily have to, in most jurisdiction, we don't necessarily have to provide an opinion in the internal control systems within the organization. We just have to review them, review some of them to make sure that there's no, uh, we can, you know, rely on them and it's operating effectively so that, uh, so that we can make sure that the financial statement figures are not affected in any way. Okay, folks, that's basically what we do. And, and we do not provide any opinion on the internal control systems. However, when it comes to jurisdictions like the US, if we are following the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, then we would have to uh, take a look at the internal control systems and provide an opinion on that as well. Okay, folks, remember that. That's a really important point. And now moving on to other deficiencies. So other deficiencies are basically orally communicated to the appropriate level of management, isn't it? So remember that. Now moving to the next aspect that is uh, uh, IAC 300 planning. Okay, folks, let's talk about planning the audit. So. The objective of the auditor is to plan the audit so that it will be performed in an effective manner, which is why we plan anything, isn't it? If you're you know, planning to go for a vacation, then we book the, uh, book the tickets freehand, we apply for leaves, etc., isn't it? So just like that, if you're planning an audit, why exactly are we doing these things? This is so that the particular plan here or particular objective here of going on a vacation or planning an audit can be uh, executed efficiently and effectively, isn't it? So that's basically why we conduct the planning process. And what is the planning process exactly? Planning process includes two sets of activities. There is the preliminary engagement activities as well as the planning activities as well. The preliminary engagement activities is something that we looked at where we look at two things. First of all, we have to evaluate the compliance with ethical requirements. Have we complied with the ethical requirements and is there any you know, threat to independence or objectivity? That's basically something that we look for. And of course, we also have to establish the terms of the engagement as well within the AEL or in other words, audit engagement letter. Okay, folks, as simple as that. And when we conduct planning activities, we have to develop the audit strategy. The audit strategy is like the framework on which the plan is built. Okay, folks, it's a basic structure of how the audit should go. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Uh, however, uh, after that, after developing the strategy, we have to develop the uh, audit plan as well. So what is the audit plan? This is basically a detailed version of the uh, you know audit strategy. That's basically all it is. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. And the audit strategy, uh, it basically sets out the scope, timing, and direction of the audit and guides the development of the audit plan. Okay, folks, we use the audit strategy to create a detailed audit plan. That's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, now moving on to one of the uh, important topics when it comes to the uh, any audit and assurance exam, isn't it? Be it uh, AA as well as be it AAA as well, isn't it? So when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, this particular set of topics, what is the idea here, guys? In your exam, you would be tested, you will be mandatorily be tested on an audit risk question or on a risk of material misstatement question. Usually, it, it would, would be an audit risk question where you may have to point out some aspects. What, what, what exactly do we have to point out here? We have to point out the inherent risks or control risk or detection risk, isn't it? So let's talk about it, shall we? What is an audit risk exactly and how is it different from business risk? To put it very simply, before I deep dive in, to put it very simply, an audit risk is the risk that the financial statements might be materially misstated. Okay, folks? However, business risk is the risk that the, there could be some sort of, you know, event or activity happening that can affect the business as a whole. Okay, folks, we're not focusing on the financial statements when it comes to business risk. That's basically the only difference here. Now, let's read through it, shall we? An audit risk is defined as the risk that auditor expresses an inappropriate audit opinion when the financial statements are materially misstated, as simple as that. And uh, audit risk is the combination of inherent risk, control risk, as well as detection risk. Okay, folks, and in your exam, if you are asked to write a risk of material misstatement, then you should only write the inherent as well as control risk. However, if they are asking for an audit risk, then you can also include the detection risk aspect as well. Okay, folks, so remember that. That's another really important point. Okay, folks. And then we have the business risk. Let's quickly read through this as well. A risk resulting from significant conditions, events, circumstances, actions or inactions that would adversely affect 
an entity's ability to achieve its objectives and execute its strategies or from the setting of inappropriate objectives and strategies. So what's the idea here, guys? So whatever, uh, you know, events or transactions or circumstances, inactions or inaction that affect the business and the, uh, you know, ability of the business to uh, carry out its operations or achieve its objectives. That is what a business risk is all about, okay, folks. And in your exam, you may be, uh, you know, asked to uh, point out certain business risks from the scenario as well. So try to understand the difference here. That's really important. And, uh, you know, don't don't mix it up, okay, folks. So if you mix it up, you'll lose out on a lot of marks, not just technical marks, but also professional marks as well. Because business risk is an area where commercial acumen can be demonstrated, okay, folks. So that's a really key important thing to remember. Now, moving on to the next aspect that is IAC 320, materiality. Okay, folks, so what's the idea here? So materiality is yet again another really important area when it comes to your exam. Why exactly is that? There are two easy marks when it comes to materiality. So what you have to do is you, when, uh, when it comes to the audit risk question, the first and foremost thing that you have to do here is to provide the materiality threshold okay folks and you will have to determine the threshold based on information provided in the scenario okay folks the audit partner may state that the uh, materiality will be will be dependent upon the profitability or the total assets and based on these benchmarks provided over here you will have to uh, you know determine what the materiality would be okay folks it's kind of an easy process all you have to do is first of all read through the scenario and assess the level of risk okay folks as you think that a uh, level of risk is kind of easy, you just have to point out what all are the audit risk, isn't it? That's basically it. And if it uh, if there is too much of impact, for example, if it let's say uh, let's say that the materiality is based out of uh, profit profit before tax. Okay, folks, if it's profit before tax, then the threshold would be the threshold would be uh, you know in between five percent as well as uh, yeah. I'm just gonna write it down over here. It, it'll be between. 5% or 10%. Okay, folks, 5 to 10 is the threshold limit. So if it is, uh, uh, you know, if there are not many risks or if there is, uh, you know, not much significant risk, then uh, oh, usually there would be. So uh, if there is such a, you know, a normal amount of risk, I would say, then you can use the average amount of these as the threshold amount. However, if there is a high level of risk, for example, it's a new audit client or something, then what you can do is you can choose the lower threshold that is 5%. Of course, we've discussed about all of these. Okay, folks, we've discussed about all of the easy way to determine or exercise judgment in your answer when it comes to the uh, question practice marathon. So you can take a look at that to learn more about it. Now, moving on <clears throat> to the next aspect. So yeah, for profit, the threshold would be, and yeah, before that, what exactly is materiality? We haven't looked at that, isn't it? So what exactly is materiality? Materiality is the ability of a particular figure or information to influence the economic decision of the users of financial statement. Okay, folks. So if there is any information within the financial statement that can in influence the economic decision of a user of financial statement, then we can call that particular figure as or uh, that particular information as material. Okay, folks, that's basically it. And of course, normally in the exam, we use this particular threshold. However, in practical scenarios, we determine there's a great deal of you know judgment when determining the materiality levels as well. Okay, folks, now let's quickly read through the definition and continue. According to IAC 320, an omission or misstatement is considered to be material if they individually or in aggregate could reasonably be expected to influence the economic decision of users taken on the basis of the financial statements, as simple as that. Okay, folks. So what is the threshold here for profit before tax? It's five to 10%. For gross profit, it's uh, 0.5 to 1%. Same goes for revenue as well. And uh, total assets would be one to 2% as well. Okay, folks, so use these benchmarks to determine your uh, materiality in the exam and get those easy two marks. Now, moving on to another concept known as performance materiality. So what's the idea here, guys? Performance materiality is the amount of or amounts set by the auditor at less than materiality for the financial statement as a whole to reduce an appropriately low level, uh, to reduce to an appropriately low level, the probability that aggregate of uncorrected misstatements exceed materiality for the financial statement as a whole. So what are we doing here, guys? What we're going to do is we're going to aggregate all the uncorrected misstatements and compare it with the PM or performance materiality and make sure that it's not exceeding the PM, isn't it? So that's basically how we use it. And what is PM exactly? It's a materiality level that is lower than the lower, the normal, uh, you know, level of materiality. That's basically it. Okay, folks. 
Now moving on to IAC 330 auditors respond to SS risk. So how exactly does an auditor respond to SS risk? Well, if they identify an ROMM or risk of material misstatement, they conduct audit procedures, isn't it? They conduct substantive procedures or analytical procedures to obtain more evidence about the issue. Okay, folks? Uh, yeah, to obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence, as simple as that. Now moving on to ISA 450, evaluation of misstatements identified during audit, uh, where we learn, uh, well, this is basically where we, uh, you know, learn about how exactly do we evaluate the misstatements identified during the audit, isn't it? So how exactly do we do that? What we do is we aggregate the uncorrected misstatements and ignore the ones that are clearly material or clearly trivial. And then we compare it to the materiality level, isn't it? If it is exceeding materiality, then what we have to do is we have to consider as to whether, uh, you know, the materiality should be revised or, uh, you know, we, we communicate things to the management as well, isn't it? So if the management refuses to make the particular uh, uh, amendments to the financial statements, then what they do is they have to, they, they'll assess as to whether, uh, you know, this this would have a serious impact on the opinion or not. If there, if there is some sort of, uh, you know, proceed, if, this, if there is some sort of impact on the opinion, then this is communicated to the management or uh, if they don't make any actions, then those charge with governance as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically how we evaluate the misstatements. So we're just, you know, taking a look at the, uh, you know, un, uh, sorry, uncorrected misstatements within the financial statement. The material ones, well, that can be determined using the materiality threshold, isn't it? So we're just gonna, we're just making sure that the uncorrected misstatement does not, you know, combine together to create a material misstatement. That's basically it. Okay, folks, that's basically all we're trying to do here. So yeah, we will also have to conduct uh, we will also have to consider if the, let's say the management refuses to make any changes, then we have to consider, uh, you know, various aspects such as the integrity of the management as to whether the audit strategy should be revised because there's an increased level of risk now, or if the materiality level needs to be revised as well. Okay, folks, so these things should be considered here as well. Now, moving on to another area that is the types of misstatements. Let's talk about this, shall we? So when we talk about the types of misstatements, there are three basic types of misstatements that we need to learn here. First of all, there is factual misstatements, which is uh, those misstatements to which there are there is no doubt that it's it's not a misstatement, isn't it? So that's sorry, it's a it's a misstatement, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. It's, it just it is true and confirms with reality, and we don't have any doubt about it. Now moving on to judgmental misstatement, and this is kind of a, you know an interesting thing. It is the difference in accounting estimate of the auditor. Considers uh, are considered as unreasonable, or the uh, accounting, or the uh, or the selection or application of accounting policies that the auditor considers inappropriate. So, what's the idea here, guys? So, there might be a lot of judgmental figures in the financial statement, isn't it? Such as the useful life of depreciation or amortization or fair value figures, etc. So, if the auditor deems that you know these uh, you know judgmental areas could be misstated, then what that's what we call a judgmental misstatement. Okay, folks, so that's basically the case, and we obtain more evidence on that area. And finally, we have projected misstatements and as well, and this is primarily based on the samples as well. Okay, folks, so the idea here is that we just have, we're just making sure that uh, you know the projected misstatement is basically the auditor's best estimate. Okay, folks. So basically, we just uh, you know taking a look at a, a sample. Let's say that we've selected a particular sample from a population, and we've identified you know two or three misstatements in that. So if I selected a small fraction of the population and identified two or three misstatements, what would be the total misstatement of the entire population? This is what projected misstatement is all about. Okay, folks, it's the best estimate by auditor. Uh, and what he does is he just, you know, extrapolates the, uh, you know, number of, uh, there are several methods to calculate this, but, you know, we don't have to look at the calculation aspect. We just have to know the theoretical aspects here. Okay, folks, that's basically it. So, uh, you know, whenever you enter into, a, let's say, an audit firm, or so you will be learning about those uh, methods to calculate these as well. So, yeah, uh, each, each uh, you know, each audit firm uses their own methodology. So, yeah, there's that. Now, <clears throat> Moving on to, uh, yeah, uh, coming back to the uh, projected misstatements, you, you just, you're just making sure or you're just calculating the total misstatement of the total population based on the sample that you've selected. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So those were some different types of misstatements. Now moving on to one of the key things that we do in audit, which is basically to identify and assess the risk of material misstatement through understanding the entity and its environment. So let's take a look at this, shall we? In this standard, we look at four things primarily. First of all, why exactly should we look at an entity and its environment? 
That's that's kind of an obvious answer, isn't it? It's just so that we can understand what the organization is and what it does. And of course, we're not only focusing on the environment here, isn't it? We're also focusing on the external environment, or the business environment of our particular audit client as well. And why do we do this exactly? Well, as auditors, our objective is to look at the financial statement, isn't it? So why exactly are we looking at the business-related aspects? Well, that's basically so that we can understand how a particular financial uh, figure has changed from the prior year or what exactly is the reason why uh, a particular figure is what it is now. Exactly, folks, that's basically it. So by assessing the entity and its environment, we will get relevant information which can be used as explanation for the financial figures and the financial statements. And of course, uh, you know, if there is any sort of risk that we've identified or if, if, if there's any sort of unusual change that we've identified in some of the figures, then, uh, you know, by having an understanding of the organization, we would be able to provide an explanation to a certain extent. Okay, folks, so we would be able to identify what are the reasonable changes as well as what are the unreasonable changes, etc. Okay, folks, so that's basically why we look at the, uh, you know, entity and its environment. Now we're moving on to the next aspect that is, what should we look at? Now that's a really interesting thing, isn't it? So what exactly are we looking at in order to assess the entity and its environment? We will be looking at obviously the industry in which the audit client operates in. We will be looking at the business environment as to what exactly is the current scenario within its business environment, uh, you know, the political environment of this particular uh, organization, the economic environment, you know, maybe a uh, you know, small pest analysis kind of thing. The more information we get, the better. Okay, folks. And of course, we look at the business model. What exactly does the organization do? That's really important to understand, isn't it? And of course, we will also be looking at several other aspects, such as, uh, you know, whether it has uh, a lot of, you know, subsidiaries or are there a lot of investments done in the current year? Uh, are there any acquisitions, mergers, etc.? Okay, folks. So all these things will be looked at. And uh, how exactly can we do this? Or how exactly can we obtain this information? Well, we can obtain this information by inspecting various documents, inquiring things with management, and of course, through observations as well. Okay, folks, that's basically the thing. Uh, and finally, we can also, uh, the final uh, aspect when it comes to this particular standard is, where exactly can we get this information from? Well, there's another number of number of sources here as well. Okay, folks, for example, for the basic understanding of the audit file or of the organization, what we can do is we can take a look at the permanent audit files that we use, isn't it? That's basically a really relevant source of information. And of course, if, if we have conducted the audit in the prior year as well, then uh, we can also take a look at the prior year, uh, you know, current working papers. Sorry, yeah, the prior year working work papers as well. And uh, to go to, you know, more a bit uh, broader, I would say we can also uh, discuss things or inquire things with the management. We can take a look at the company's websites and several other sources as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, idea about this particular standard. It's just a basic thing. And remember, this is one of the most important steps when auditing a particular audit client. Because if you don't have an understanding of uh, as to what, how, what or how the client works, then it'll be a bit difficult to understand how the financial figures are moving and whether it's reasonable or not. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. Now, moving on to the next aspect, analytical procedures. So, uh, what exactly are analytical procedures? What exactly or why exactly do we conduct analytical procedures? Well, it's kind of a simple process. It's basically comparing the current year information with the prior year and, of course, comparing, you know, comparative information or financial information such as, uh, you know, budgets or forecasts, the current year information to the budgets and forecasts, etc., to identify plausible relationship between the figures, isn't it? And, of course, to identify any sort of unusual trends, etc., as well. So that's basically why we conduct analytical procedures. Okay, folks? And remember, guys, analytical procedures only looks at the total figure, isn't it? The uh, total figures provided in the financial statements. That's basically what we're focusing on when we conduct the analytical procedures. However, in order to, you know, deep dive, into these total figures, what we do is we conduct something known as test of details, isn't it? So keep that, uh, keep that, uh, you know, understanding in mind and understand the difference between an analytical procedures and a test of detail. Okay, folks, analytical procedures only just scratch the surface. That's basically what we do here. Whereas, uh, you know, in test of detail, we deep dive in to the journals, ledgers, etc., and conduct procedures over there. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, idea here. Now, when exactly do we conduct analytical procedures? 
We conduct analytical procedures at each of the stages of audit, but let's understand why, shall we? So at the planning stage, we conduct, let me just uh, highlight this. There we go. Oh, sorry about that. So at the planning stage, we use analytical procedures in order to identify and assess the risk of material misstatement. So we can conduct analytical procedures to identify and assess the risk of material misstatement by understanding the entity and its environment. Okay, folks, that's basically uh, as to why we use analytical procedures at the planning stage. Now, during the phase of audit, we can conduct analytical procedures for risk assessment procedures, and of course, you conduct substantive procedures as well. And at the review stage of the audit, okay, folks, at the review stage of the audit, we can conduct analytical procedures to obtain an overall conclusion that the financial statements are consist consistent with the auditor's understanding as well. Okay, folks, so this is why we use analytical procedures and this is, uh, you know, why we use analytical procedures at each of the stages of audit. Okay, folks, so that's basically the thing. And of course, now we move on to the next aspect that is uh, ratio analysis, which is, you know, kind of straightforward. You've learned a lot of ratios throughout a lot of papers, isn't it? So you can use any and every ratios, but, you know, to sum up a few, I've I mentioned a few here. Let's take a look. We have uh, gross profit margin, which is gross profit divided by sales revenue times 100, net profit margin, which is profit before tax by sales revenue times 100, which is like the common ratio that we know, isn't it? And then there are some uh, more ratios such as uh, receivable days, which you can uh, which you can use or you can, can be tested in the exam. So uh, keep this in mind. We have, yeah, receivables divided by revenue times 365. Why exactly should you remember these, uh, you know, formulas for ratio analysis? Well, that's basically because there would be a question in the uh, exam which requires you to, uh, you know, conduct analytical procedures. Okay, folks, there is a chance that analytical procedures can be tested in the exam. And of course, even if it's not specifically mentioned in the scenario, if you do some sort of, you know, increased calculations or ratio calculations, then you would get around half mark for that to a maximum of two marks. Okay, folks, so that's basically uh, some of the easy marks in the exam. Isn't it? So keep this in mind. And then... We have payable days as well, which is uh, payables divided by purchases, or in other words, cost of sales in some instances as well, times 365. Same goes for inventory uh, days as well, inventory divided by cost of sales times 365, as simple as that. We have current ratio, that is <clears throat> current assets divided by current liabilities. Quick ratio, that is current assets minus inventory divided by uh, current liabilities. Uh, there are some investors ratios such as gearing ratios, which is borrowings divided by share capital processors or in other words, debt by debt plus equity or debt by equity as well. Debt to equity ratio is also uh, a common ratio. And what else? There is ROCE or profit before interest and tax divided by share capital plus reserves plus borrowings or in other words, we call it capital employed, isn't it? So that's basically uh, some of the basic ratios that you have to understand. And of course, you can also use other ratios such as, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, earnings per share or you know, interest cover. Interest cover is a commonly used ratio when it comes to the AAA exam to understand whether we breach some sort of long covenants or so. So yeah. Uh, now moving on to the next aspect that is transnational audit. So what exactly is transnational audit all about? Transnational audit means an audit of financial statements which may be relied upon outside the entity's home jurisdiction. Okay, folks, so we might be operating in one particular uh, jurisdiction or country. However, our audit client may be from another uh, country. Okay, folks, so therefore, they may have their own, uh, you know, local accounting standards, local auditing standards, etc. Isn't it? So we may have to get a better understanding of that in order to conduct audit for them, isn't it? So that's basically what a transnational audit is. And some factors that we have to take under consideration here is that, uh, you know, is the audit standards, first of all. Are there any local auditing standards? Then should, uh, we should have the knowledge of those in order to conduct the audit, isn't it? So that's something that we should take a look at. Regulation and oversight of auditors. So how exactly is the audit profession regulated in that particular uh, organization? Is there a specific national law that they follow? Or if, is there any specific procedures that the jurisdiction states? Then we have to follow that, isn't it? Or formalities, etc. All, all of these things. Uh, we have to follow all of these things mentioned in their home jurisdiction as well, isn't it? So that's basically something to take a look at. And of course, the financial reporting standards. What would be the applicable financial reporting framework for our audit client? 
do they follow IFR standards or do they follow let's say US GAAP or uh, do they follow any other local accounting standards etc that's basically something to look at and finally uh, corporate governance requirement are there any uh, you know is it mandatory to comply with the corporate governance requirements mentioned by the jurisdiction that's basically something that we should take a look at as well <clears throat> now moving on to the next aspect so let's talk about the financial statement assertions here it's kind of straightforward isn't it so there are basically two sets of two categories of transactions that occur within an organization there are uh, transactions and events and as well uh, and then there are account balances as well isn't it so transactions and events are basically items which are stated in the statement of profit and loss whereas account balances are basically items that are stated in the balance sheet or in other words as we call it the statement of financial position isn't it so remember that so for each of these, uh, you know, categories of transactions, we have uh, we have a <clears throat> we have a set of assertions. Okay, folks, there are some specific assertions uh, which are unique to each of these categories of transactions, and then there are common items as well. So let's take a look at each of these. So we have OC and well uh, as well as ER for account balances in it. So what does OC stands for? OC O stands for occurrence. C is for Qatar. Okay, folks. So these are uh, these are specific to transaction and events. And when it comes to account balances, some specific uh, you know assertions that we have here are basically uh, existence as well as rights and obligations as well. Okay, folks. Now, uh, what exactly are assertions? Assertions are basically management representations. And what they do is they just state that okay, so this is basically how we prepared our financial statement, and it's uh, you know uh, the all the transaction has actually occurred and uh, occurred, or all the transactions and events that we've recorded have actually occurred, and uh, they say that you know every accounting transaction has been included in the correct accounting period, and all our account balances do actually exist or all our assets actually exist or obligations are are present and of course uh, you know we do have ownership over the assets and we do have an obligation to pay our liabilities etc and we as auditors what we have to do is we have to test these assertions we have to ensure that uh, the management representation of the assertions are true or not okay folks that's basically what we are trying to do as auditors isn't it so that's basically it and of course some more uh, let's talk about some more common assertions we have accp okay folks accp common in both of these it's kind of the same thing so uh let's take a look at as to what the uh you know expansion or what accp stands for a stands for accuracy which basically mentioned that each and every figure within the financial statement is accurate. C stands for completeness. Have we completely recorded everything that is there to record? And the next C is for classification. Have we classified the numbers, uh, you know, uh, as per the relevant standard or as per the appropriate category? Okay, folks, have we, let's say, uh, let's say, uh, for example, uh, let's say we are taking a loan out of a bank. Okay, folks, so have we? Uh, recognize the appropriate non-current liability as well as current liability appropriately. So that's basically what we're ensuring here. And uh, the next P stands for presentation. We folks have we presented everything as per the relevant accounting standards. So that's basically the uh, idea here behind assertions. Now moving on to compute rated audit techniques. So when it comes to compute rated audit techniques, there are two sets of things that we've learned here. One, we learned about test data, isn't it? So what is test data? It's basically inputting some dummy data into the client system to ensure that the client system is working appropriately, isn't it? So that's basically it. We have live and dead test data. So what is live test data? It's basically when you conduct the test data procedures during the normal operating cycle of the client. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Uh, and then dead test data is when you, uh, you know, conduct the procedures outside the normal, uh, you know, operating cycle of the client just to ensure that there are no business disruptions or uh, anything like that. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. Uh, as to when we use it will depend upon the uh, kind of procedure or objective that we have. Okay, folks, that's basically it. And secondly, we have audit softwares as well. Okay, folks, and audit software can help us in a lot of ways, isn't it? So it can help us to calculate things a bit more accurately and then we can help, uh, help us to sort the data so that we can you know use the relevant data and ignore the relevant ones and we can filter out the information from a huge set of data uh, in, a, in with these and then yeah we can create reports in like minutes and of course you know there would be a lot of templates etc provided by the software so we can create the reports in a, on a quick basis and finally we can also identify exceptions what are exceptions Exceptions are basically unusual changes 
or unusual deviations, etc., that we detect from when comparing information, etc. Okay, folks, so that's basically so anything unusual, that's basically what it means here. Okay, folks, so uh, so this is basically the uh, what what the audit software is used for. And of course, there are also some disadvantages because you know we have to provide the sufficient amount of training to the staff in order to be familiar with this audit software. And of course, uh, you know there are also cost implications as well. For example, if our audit firm is planning to purchase a tailor-made software, then uh, you know it, it'll have it'll be a bit more expensive, and we need to have the sufficient level of IT uh, professionals to help us with the maintenance of these sort of softwares, isn't it? So that's basically uh, some points to keep in mind here. Now, moving on to the next aspect, we have ISA 500 audit evidence. First of all, what exactly is or how exactly should the evidence